Good morning and welcome to Science World. Our first story today takes us into the water, actually to the bottom of the ocean in some cases. Tanya Ruiz has an interesting story about oceans and medical research. Hello. So many of us love the ocean. We love going to the beach and enjoying the sun, sand and water. But how often do you stop and think about how important oceans are? Not only do they provide a place for recreation, but they also give us food and energy. And, more and more, oceans offer the possibility of new information for treating human disease as well as new medicines. Researchers have long searched the natural world, forests, swamps and rainforests, for substances to use in medicine. In fact, more than half of all prescription drugs are derived from naturally occurring products. And now, scientists are looking to the oceans for their research. Did you know that water covers about 71% of Earth's surface? Yes, 71%. And 97% of that water is in the oceans. So it's not surprising that oceans support the greatest variety of life on the planet. And now, new technologies allow researchers to go deeper into the ocean, deeper than they've ever been able to go. And as a result, it's possible to study fish and other sea life that they've never been able to study before. So scientists hope this will offer new, and possibly enormous, resources for the medical field. Now, you may not realize it, but there are already some medical substances in use today that were derived from the sea. The horseshoe crab, a very old, actually ancient, marine creature, is one of the most famous examples. In the 1950s, scientists discovered that the blood of the horseshoe crab could protect it from bacteria, and they realized that this could be helpful in medical procedures for humans. As a result, it's now commonly used in hospitals to test for contamination that would be harmful to humans. Current research focuses on a wide range of ocean life, from fish to coral to whales to mud on the bottom of the ocean. One example is the skatefish. The skatefish has unique eyes and can see in total darkness. Researchers are studying how the eyes of this fish work with the hope of learning more about eye disease in humans, which often leads to blindness. Another fish that scientists want to learn about is the toadfish. The toadfish is a very unattractive fish, but it interests scientists because it can swim incredibly fast, about 40 times faster than a world-class human sprinter. Researchers are studying the anatomy of the fish in the hopes of being able to use what they learn to help with, among other things, heart disease in humans. It makes sense that muscles that can work as fast as a toadfish's might give researchers clues about how to help human muscles that are failing from disease. There's also a snail that scientists believe will offer a new painkiller. And then there's coral. There are substances from coral that researchers hope might offer a way to combat cancer. And finally, a possible innovation in washing clothes. A bacteria from whales that helps break down oily stains in laundry. Obviously, this might help make a better laundry detergent someday. So, there's a lot of variety in the research. Some scientists caution that this is all a very slow process and that we have to be careful. It could take years for any one thing to be tested and proven safe and useful. But many researchers are still excited and hopeful. And then, of course, everyone is aware that it's important to protect the oceans when we do this work. But this gives us all a little more to think about next time we're lying on a beach in the sun. This is Tanya Ruiz for Science World. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Condor Station. I'd like to give you a little bit of history and background for our Condor Recovery Program, and then I'll answer any questions you might have. I'll start with some history. In 1987, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service captured the last condor in the wild and put it into a breeding program. 
Imagine that was the last wild condor, and no one knew if the species could recover. Fortunately, the surviving condors mated and produced offspring. Now, after more than 17 years, there are 149 condors living in captivity and 99 flying free in California, Arizona, and Baja, Mexico. More birds are being released into the wild whenever possible, and we know that at least five pairs of birds are mating in the wild. So, that's good news. Now, you can guess that we'd want to keep track of the birds in the wild, so how do we do that? We've used different tracking systems, but now GPS, global positioning systems, attached to the birds give us our best information. Just so you can appreciate our work, think of trying to attach one of the units to a bird with a nine-foot wingspan. Those wings could come close to knocking you out, and the beak is as sharp as the sharpest knife in your kitchen. <laughs> this part of the job can be challenging. Anyway, GPS gives us a lot of data. Geographic coordinates within 14 feet for up to 16 hours a day. This is very specific and useful information. One thing we've learned is that condors fly a lot more distance in any day than we ever knew. We've also discovered something that is very interesting and potentially even more helpful. We found that the species is intelligent and much more complicated than we thought. Until now, we hadn't really known how much condors actually have to learn to survive in the wild, but we now know that they do indeed have to learn to survive. An example of this comes from one of the mistakes we made in the early days of raising baby condors. We had humans taking care of the babies. The people wore puppets on their hands that looked like adult condors, but they didn't act like parent condors. They just used the puppets to give the babies food. Then those babies were put together with other babies and had no contact with adult condors. Now, what we realized later was that because of this approach, the baby condors didn't learn to be afraid of people. After they were released, they would approach people without any fear at all, begging for food at campgrounds and things like that. They acted like pets instead of wild animals. Obviously, this wasn't good. After watching adult condors with babies, we realized that the parent condors taught the babies a lot about being cautious and defending themselves. The parent condors spent a lot of time harassing their babies, pecking at them and, and pushing them away when they're too curious. And this teaches them to be careful and to protect themselves. So now we consider this in raising baby condors. All the babies in the program are raised either by an adult condor or by a human wearing a puppet that looks like a condor. The humans are trained to act like a parent condor, as I said, pecking and harassing the babies. We found that baby condors raised in this way, actually taught to be cautious, are much more likely to avoid humans. Another area we've learned a lot about because of the GPS monitoring is the way groups of condors relate and work together. Condors are scavengers, so they need to look for dead animals to eat. Now, you've probably never thought of it, but that's not the same as an animal that hunts for food. Think about it. A scavenger is dependent on finding a dead animal to eat at the right time, or it goes hungry. So what we found is that condors actually share information about good locations for food. There's actually a kind of apprenticeship where condors work together. A more experienced bird helps a less experienced bird learn where to find food. It's not really something you'd imagine birds doing, is it? Another surprising point is how social these birds are. Through the information from GPS units, we found that birds actually do like to socialize. One group of birds will travel about 160 miles down the coast to visit another group and hang out. That's something many of us can relate to, although we might not travel 160 miles all that often, even to visit a good friend. So that's some background on the condors. Why is this work important? Well, first, of course, we'd like to have wild condors living without interference from us. But 
In a broader sense, we can always learn. As I've mentioned, we found that condors are very intelligent, and their lives are more complex than we'd realized. So we never know what else we might learn, or how this information might apply to other animals' problems, or even people's problems for that matter.